So Roy, you were telling us that uh, you were just kind of getting your set going when uh, you ran into a little uh, time constraint. Oh, it, you know, it's, that's just part of it. Well, how is it when you're performing at a festival like this as opposed to when you're doing your own set? Do uh, you have more time to, to stretch out and learn? Does it well, usually when you're in an, out, in an outdoor event, you know, they kind of keep it kind of cl closely knit. And, you know, I mean, it's everything is kind of, you know, very put together in an orderly fashion. So you kind of have to just kind of go with it. And does, uh, do you do anything different to get the, the whole band like uh, into the groove a little faster in a set that you might otherwise? Or? Um, it's just timing. Yeah. Uh, placing, uh, like, at the end of the song, starting the rhythm so they know exactly where it is, you know. Keeping it simple. Yeah. The KISS principle. And how did you find the uh, fans today here at Newport? Oh, they, they seem to be having a good time in spite of the uh, dark skies. Yeah. But it's still beautiful out here, you know. It's, uh, you know, I, I always like playing near the water. It's, it sort of gives an, uh, an inspiration because you're really close to nature and it just sort of gives you that uh, driving energy. <laughs> when, um, when we use this interview, we're going to be hearing your answers, but nobody's ever going to hear my questions. So if I ask you things like, you know, how is the how are the how is the crowd here today? If you could start off by saying something like, you know, well the crowd here at Newport, but that kind of thing, so that so that people know what you're talking about because they're never going to hear what I ask you. Right, right. Um, but you were talking about nature and and, and being close yeah. to and giving you a good feeling. It's nice. Uh, you know, whenever we play in a situation where there's water nearby, it's always fun. That inspire you to play uh, Nature Boy as part of the set today? Uh, that's that's just one of the tunes that's uh, in the repertoire. Larry Willis arranged it. You know, uh, we just kind of play one chorus of that, and it leads into uh, an original song by Larry Willis, which is called "To Wisdom the Prize." Yeah. Okay. Could you give us that again and, and uh, mention Nature Boy in the? Because I asked you Nature Boy, but nobody will hear that. So. Uh, well, we started the, the, it's really like, uh, well, when we played Nature Boy, it's like a, an introduction to a song written by Larry Willis called Two Wisdom the Prize. Okay. Why, though? I mean, they hear what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? You hear it. They You're can right. edit it. You're right. We can edit it. But right. If, uh, and that's why it helps when you give us the introductory part of the comic. I know. I'm I know. listening. But it feels forced. Yeah. Um, anyway, what'd you say? I read something about you comparing your playing or trying to... No, I'm back, I'm back. I'm just playing. Uh, <laughs> you were talking about playing a trumpet, trying to kind of be like a singer, imitate like a singer. And a lot of times, you know, we always hear about singers talking about how they're trying to be like musical instruments, but we don't usually hear Musicians talk about him trying to emulate singers. Well, most horn, most horn players, you know, when you talk about uh, playing like singers, horn players tend to want to have a sound that represents the voice, and so you know, and in turn, the, the vocalists want to be able to move around with their voice, you know, and have dexterity, like uh, musicians, like horn players. You know, it goes both ways. I mean, it actually, you know, if you can get a balance of both, you know, uh, of of being able to communicate your ideas clearly, you know, that comes with practice and, and doing the, uh, the, the tedious things like long tones and uh, lip slurs and ah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, and then actually saying something, you know, going, actually, you know, making a, a statement that has like a beginning, middle, and an end, you know, that tells a story. You know, so if it's like balancing both of those things, you know, because you have a lot of cats. Some some musicians play with uh, a lot of uh, technique, and they have, you know, they can dazzle you, and, and you'll be like, "Wow, how did he do that?" But then there are, then there are other cats that just play one note, and you're like in tears, you know. So it's like having a balance of both of those things. You know, you can't have one without the other, like love and marriage. Love and marriage. So do you want to talk? Do you want to start with that influences thing? 
Yeah, well, or what do you want to say? I always listen to a lot of, lot of uh, singers and uh, people like Nat King Cole, Shirley Horn, Sarah Vaughn, and, uh, little Jimmy Scott. Man, it's, it's because, I mean, you know, if you know the words to the song, it, it helps you to really understand how to project the right kind of mood while you're playing the melody and, and to interpret the melody, you know. And I believe that, you know, in, in just like really just speaking the melody and making the statement, you know, without a lot of embellishment. I mean, some is cool, but like too much can be, you know, like you, you're you wondering what song is he playing? What's, what song is that? <laughs> it sounds like, you know, and that's not it. You know, so uh, uh, that's why, you know, I, I try to listen to a lot of uh, vocal jazz, as well as just, I mean, just any kind of singers, you know, gospel and, uh, and R&B. Just helps you de to develop your sound so that you you know you use your instrument as a voice. Uh, as far as like trumpet players go, there's a whole list of cats that I've listened to uh, for inspiration. People like Clifford Brown and uh, Fast Navarro, Lee Morgan and Blue Mitchell, Kenny Dorham, Dizzy Miles, uh, definitely Louis Armstrong and Roy Eldridge. I mean, there's so many, you know. Um, and, and I think that, you know, this is the kind of thing that builds your vocabulary as, as far as, uh, you know, the things that you play when you improvise. You draw on more or less, you know, not so many, so much transcribing the solos note for note, but just understanding maybe why he might have played that phrase, you know. Or, or just really trying to understand what he might have been feeling that day the reason why I played that. <laughs> what made you get started as a musician in the first place? What made you want to or inspired you? Man, I heard uh, my elementary school band play and the kids were getting up taking solos and I was like, I was, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. <laughs> Where was that? Not too many elementary I was in Texas at William Brown Miller Elementary. They had a, we had a band called the Children of Production. It was, uh, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade level. And uh, split up between two different schools, William Brown Miller and John Neely Bryan, which was on the other side of town. So we got together on the weekends to practice together. And, uh, you know, this was a special thing because uh, the band director, a guy named Dean Hill, could teach the kids how to improvise, you know, based, more or less based on the blues, you know. Nothing too complicated, just, you know, maybe a few, he'd get you in the office and sit you, you know, play something on the piano like, uh, doom, 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 something like that, right? And, you know, give you like three or four little blues phrases and you take it home, you practice. And then when you get on stage at the performance, he's there next to you, urging you to really express it, you know, to really say it, you know, so, you know, you, this is how I developed like uh, the uh, emotional quality of jazz. And early on, you know, from being around Mr. Hill. <laughs> you know, because I mean, he would, you, you'd be playing and, and then he would just be like, go ahead, go ahead, you know, say it like you mean it, you know, and that, that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, really made you dig in. Did, uh, did you get a chance to? teach or lecture to kids or students and music students and share that kind of feeling with them? Yeah, um, every time I get some, you know, some time off, I, I try to uh, make it a point to stay, you know, in the educational system. Like, we did a tour of about 40 public schools in New York with Lincoln Center, uh, like, uh, about a year ago. And then, um, you know, whenever we go to a town where there's a, you know, like, if we're doing, like, a college date, I'll make sure I do a master class or two or something like that because it's important to uh, keep the, the tradition alive within the educational system too. I mean, there's only so much that you can learn in a classroom as far as learning how to play, but there are you know certain things that that uh, sort of help you develop as far and you and you have a lot of time to practice, you know, and and 
compose, you know, because when you start getting on the road, there's no more time for anything. <laughs> That's it. It's like get up and take a train, a, then a plane, then a boat, then the bus, and then to the stage, and then to the hotel, and then sleep for three hours, and then do it all again. <laughs> that doesn't sound so glamorous. Yeah, but it's it's still, you know, the reward comes with um, when we get on stage and the people become uplifted by the music, you know. So that's why we're here. And, um, you know, the hardest part is actually getting to the gig. But, you know, when we actually get there and, and we get the, the energy going back and forth with the people, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it, it, it makes it all worthwhile, you know. I suppose you've been doing that all over the world. Yeah, everywhere, yeah. A lot of places. Not all over the world, not yet. But what you're working on. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, um, so you get inspired in the playing before the audience, or the, when the audience brings it back to you. Is it, is it like a sort of like a conversation you're having with the audience, or something where they have what they, how they respond to you? Does that kind of? Um, I think that like in outdoor events, uh, you know, the people are further away, so you have to project the music past the foot of the stage. You know, and. Uh, and in a small, small, like in a small club setting, you know, the people are right there in front of you, so it's a little bit more intimate. So I think it varies between, you know, with different kinds of audiences. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes when you're outside, if, if it's nice and the weather's good, people really get up and start partying, you know. And, and then, like in clubs, you know, it, it, it can turn into something like a revival, you know. Depending on uh, on the situation and where you are and what kind of music you play for them, <laughs> if it matches, you know what they want to hear. <laughs> You've already given me uh, plenty that I can use. All right, cool.